I'm here to talk to you briefly about composer, artist, pianist, polymath, Paul Reale, whose music will be recorded very soon for release on Noxos. Paul Reale is probably one of the most interesting, not only composers, but one of the most interesting people I remember walking this planet. Unfortunately, he's not walking the planet anymore. But the memory of my times with him linger on in a beautiful fashion. And suffice it to say that in my estimation, Paul Reale was probably one of the finest composers this country has produced. Um, for many reasons. One of the reasons I can cite that is that he was amenable to suggestions by performers that played his music, of which there was quite a bit, he wrote an enormous amount of repertoire. And it was my experience of compositions that he wrote, particularly for my piano trio, the Miracore Trio, many years ago, in the 80s principally, that if there was something that could have been rendered better on our individual instruments, Paul was not opposed to making those adjustments. And I must say that a lot of composers I've dealt with who are 20th century bound and 20th century um, figures said, nope, you, I wrote this and you have to do it this way. No matter what we as professional musicians and instrumentalists had to say. And so meeting Paul was uh, a, a very instructive because he would often come with a, a very a state of mind that was imbued with a lot of self-confidence. But, you know, if you said, well, I think it could be this way, and he'd always counter with, oh, that's true. <laughs> so uh, I got used to him saying that, which uh, out of the mouth of a composer is pretty rare. Um, so Paul uh, was one of my uh, best musical friends, and I felt the deep loss when uh, this planet lost him. And now to the music that we are recording with William Boughton and the Yale Symphony this weekend. Um, this piano concerto that we're putting together is listed as piano concerto number one. I had the enviable opportunity of performing it, the premiere actually, in, of all places, Madison, Wisconsin, with the Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra, I believe in the mid 80s. I'm not secure on the year, but I think it was 1986, which was a very busy year for me and uh, the trio I was in. However, this piece, there was no trio. It was just me and the Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra. And I remember uh, uh, Paul visiting, just a little, uh, a little sidebar about his visit. When he got to Iowa, where I was living and teaching at Grinnell College, he uh, didn't prepare himself for Midwestern weather because he was an Angelino. He had lived on the East Coast, but uh, he came from uh, LA and was uh, a little uh, short on jackets and coats. And we, this was in October, I believe, maybe mid to late October. And he said, gee, it's chilly here. So I loaned him a, a, a jacket. <laughs> he was thankful for that. but. Um, uh, he, he attended the rehearsals with the Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra with David Crosby, the late David Crosby, who was a very, very talented, wonderful conductor and a fine gentleman. And we did the uh, premiere, but he hadn't written out any piano cadences. So here's an example of how he put his life together with other musicians. And that's the best phrase I can come with it, uh, was that he, uh, he, he allowed me to improvise the, the cadenza based on, or maybe not, based on what had preceded the cadenza passages. And uh, so he entrusted that to me, and I thought, well, I have a bit of a jazz background, so I thought improvising on the material that I had played up to the cadenza portion of the movement, I thought, I can make something out of this. And uh, I, I, I wasn't concerned about how Paul would receive it, because I know that he, accepted an awful lot of what I suggested to him um, with a carte blanche. He said, do what you want to do with this. You know, whatever you want to do, it'll be fine. 
So I improvised the cadenzas in the, in the movements of the first piano concerto. <laughs> so he, he thought, hmm, well, those are strong musical statements. I may use parts of that. So I think he used the, some of, he incorporated some of that into the written out cadenzas that uh, I'm going to be recording uh, on Noxos with the uh, Yale Symphony, which is a wonderful orchestra conducted by a first-rate musician, William Boughton, who has British roots and uh, has recorded many CDs for Nimbus. But back to Reale. Um, one of the abiding, what, opinions that uh, Paul was unshakable on was the value of tonal music. And rather than uh, writing with a tone row, that, you know, a 12-tone row, he, he railed against the dodecaphonus, and he thought that, you know, that was, and he, he put in print in many ways, and, and in many articles, and even on liner notes that he wrote for my Ives uh, CD many years ago. He, he railed against the uh, serialists and, and the people that composed in that, that style. And the music that those of you who uh, get to hear this Noxos release uh, of his piano concerto, the music figures very well into a tonal scheme of things. And it's very, very adventurous. It, it, it is cinematic in many ways. And I know Paul worshiped the cinema and we, we would have conversations about it. And he loved camera angles and how you could go from one uh, scene or, or one aspect of a, of a plot, boing, and then you were somewhere else. Um, uh, viewing a different scene entirely with maybe different emotions. And so there tends to be an eclectic nature. And that's the best word I can find to say it. Uh, Paul writes as if um, he's viewing a, a, a movie, a well-crafted movie. And so you go from one aspect of music making to boom, and then you're all of a sudden in a different sound world in a way. But he still kept to tonal precepts, and amazing, it was amazing what he could do with the concept of tonality and being in uh, tonal centers and key schemes, even though the keys that he traveled in didn't last all that long, but he, mount, he, he made the, uh, the boundaries almost limitless because you wouldn't go boink and then something totally different, but he'd in, ease into um, something that uh, took a different tune and maybe a different instrumentation and managed to make hay out of, out of, this, of these seemingly disparate uh, thematic uh, organic uh, measures of, of music. So that's the only thing I can say about uh, how he approached composition. And I, I just learned that he often wrote music on his bicycle trips <laughs> into UCLA from his home in the valley, which was an extraordinary feat to ride that far, including hills, to get to UCLA from uh, Canoga Park? Yes, Canoga Park. Those of you who know LA would know, wow, he, he rode his bike? Yes. He had a few uh, mishaps on the way, but nonetheless, uh, this is what he did. He was an original man, and uh, I, I'm sorry to say he's gone, but he would, uh, he would enjoy what is going on with this piece, I'm positive. And I had the opportunity to record a CD two year, three years ago of some of his solo piano music. He was a pianist, a very fine pianist. And he left us with a bouquet of incredible music for solo piano that is well worth considering, uh, I, I think. Um, but he knew the piano very, very well. And he wrote well for it. and. He, uh, uh, he also, I think, was influenced in some respects by a couple of composers that really come to mind right off the bat. One was Ives. Uh, I recorded the two big Ives piano sonatas in the late 80s, and uh, Paul wrote the liner notes. And part of his, uh, part of his liner notes were about, <laughs> it, it, was, it was kind of a soapbox. He, he got on his soapbox and uh, really uh, found the 12-tone system wanting and the, the serialists and, and 
those, those composers who had tied themselves to that wagon. And I thought it was kind of, it was funny, but he used that, a, a little bit of that, those program notes for my Ives recordings to kind of say, American music can be tonal and make sense in this world. And of course he joined Copeland and Barber and others of that ilk and, and Ives, whose music sometimes doesn't sound tonal, but it had tonal centers and very rarely did Ives ever uh, go in for uh, atonalism, although there were early pieces where he experimented with uh, what you might call a tone row. But uh, Paul was entranced by the music of Ives and he did some work on a piece called The Celestial Railroad, which uh, figures in many respects into the Hawthorne movement of the Concord Sonata, which I recorded uh, for music and arts in the late 80s. And so Paul had a, a, a deep affection for Charles Ives. He also, I think, although we didn't talk specifically about Hindemith, but the very opening of the piano concerto in the piano part uses extensively this little, uh, this theme, which could be Hindemith. Fourths and fifths, perfect intervals. And that's the first piano statement. And uh, you immediately are thrust into the world of, of, of B flat major, although it doesn't last. Uh, because the orchestra is doing something a bit different from the, what the keyboard player is doing. And then he shuffles off into a variety of different keys. And uh, there are a lot of tempo changes in, in Paul's music that um, passing along to an orchestra is time consuming in a way. But once you get it, it makes all sorts of sense. And I, Paul and I had many conversations where I challenged him on some of his tempo indications, his metronome markings. I said, Paul, from the music you have written, technically, it, it, it doesn't make sense at the tempo you have marked it. And he would always say, well, that, that's fine. You make it sound good. So whatever tempo you want, go for it. So I did. And I think the, the, the final uh, product, if you will, Came, comes out uh, of a whole, whole cloth. Uh, and uh, so he, he often wrote music that expanded registers. And there's, there's one passage which is very, very tough. Then you have to get back here from... So uh, there are aspects of his music that yeah, there, is, there are pianistic aspects where you're going along and everything feels very good to play, but then there are uh, situations like that where you have these huge leaps and you have to go from this part of the keyboard down here or down here to way up here. And, uh, but Paul was, uh, Paul was uh, very fond of melody and he handled lyricism extremely well, which put him, I think, in a different league from the 12 toners. And the, and the second theme, the slow theme, the lyrical theme for the first movement of the, uh, this piano concerto is a gorgeous tune. different experience. He goes from this beautiful, almost, I don't know, it almost sounds like it could be a love theme to some opera or, I don't know, almost music, movie music, although I wouldn't, I wouldn't say movie music per se, but it has that kind of, that, that beautiful lyricism, and then all of a sudden you have, and then you're off on a different express, you're, you're going to a different town. And then um, there's a gorgeous melody that, and he wrote out the piano condenses incidentally. And there's also a, a, a beautiful melody after a lot of impressionism in the second movement that sounds like this. And the interesting thing is he uses a tritone. Remember Leonard Bernstein? 
but uh, Paul used it with an intervening interval of a major third, raised fourth, fifth. Then you're in the E major. Then you're in F. Then you're in G. Then you're B flat. F, G, E flat, F. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> guy peddled his papers all over the map tonally. And that's what makes it so interesting because, uh, you know, it's not like it's not like the music of Mozart, where you could, you could hear one measure and you know what's going to happen in the next measure. Um, it's just with Paul's music, he, he gets in a little groove, and you're into this little groove, and you're going like, oh, isn't that wonderful? And you're, you're pummeled into another <laughs> experience entirely. Uh, and then uh, there's a, a little excerpt from the last movement that sounds remarkably like um, Jaws, and of course this was written, um, I guess a decade after Jaws appeared, and it's the opening of the third movement. Now Jaws is a half step, but Paul's is a whole step. And then you're in the key of, um, you start in no key, and then you wind up in the key of B flat, and then you go into F and, and D flat, and you're all over the, the musical map. But um, uh, those of you who uh, take in this little video uh, would be well uh, informed to seek out this uh, Noxus release, which features the cello concerto, which is a piece I've never heard, performed by Kim Cook, one of our better cellists on this planet. And she recorded this uh, several weeks ago. Same orchestra, same hall. and. Um, but this is, um, this is, I think the CD is two, two concertos on the same disc. Is that correct? Yeah. The cello concerto and the piano concerto. And uh, done with the same forces in the same locale. So I think those of you who find Mr. Reale's music accessible, and there's, there are trios. He wrote three piano trios for my, my trio. The Mirkor Trio, who is our violinist, is now dead. Our cellist has had rotator cuff surgery that went south. I'm, I'm the only one that's, well, the violinist is dead. But Terry King, wonderful cellist, wonderful musician, good friend, um, is not able to play anymore because of the operation that didn't go as well as it could have. So he's not playing the cello. He's doing a lot of teaching. He's in the Boston area. I hope he can show up to the concert. I think he told me he was going to try and make it. But Boston to New Haven is not a huge commute, but it's, it's a commitment. So I may see him. And, uh, you know, he and I were co good friends of Paul. In fact, that's how I met Paul, was through Terry. Because Terry at Cal State Fullerton performed a piece that Paul had written called Terza Pratica. And uh, I didn't know Paul's name from, you know, anybody. And so Terry says, you'd love this piece. So I, I listened to it and I said, Wow, who wrote that? And he said, Paul Reale. I said, who? <laughs> he said, you should meet this fellow. You'd have a lot to talk about. And Terry was absolutely right. We became good friends, and I would visit Paul and Claire whenever I could out in California. There were several times when I stayed with them, and they were remarkable hosts, and uh, uh, very, very uh, artistically centered, and basically aestheticians in a way. They, they appreciate a lot in the arts, literature, the graphic arts. Claire is a professional photographer and also a very fine cellist and musician. And she's, um, she's uh, spending some time in the listening uh, in the booth, the recording booth, seeing uh, where things need to be retaken on our recording project. But So uh, Claire is a big part of this uh, particular scene too. So all in all, uh, the music of Paul Reale is well worth the journey. And uh, I think with, with any of you with ears and hearts and emotions can find something really, really spectacular in his music. So thank you for this opportunity, and uh, I wish you all well. Take care. <laughs>